Hi everyone, uh, welcome to our sixth lecture. This lecture is on 2D kinematics under the assumption of uh, constant acceleration and it is a combined lecture between both the calc and the non-calc students. It doesn't have any calculus in it and it uh, doesn't require any calculus. Okay, so um, last lecture we did uh, vectors. That was a little bit of a mathematical aside because we needed vectors before we could uh, tackle 2D kinematics. And just to remind you what a vector is, all kinematic quantities in um, two dimension, that is position velocity or acceleration are pairs of numbers okay so you can't describe the position of something uh, with a single number the way you can in 1d and 2d you actually need two numbers uh, and velocity same thing okay uh, you'll need two numbers to describe the velocity and also the uh, acceleration all right we're not going to do a general theory of uh, 2d kinematics it's not necessary and it's even more difficult than uh, general theory of 1d kinematics instead we're going to jump right in uh, uh, and assume that we're dealing with constant acceleration. Okay, now this uh, is actually a very typical situation. In 1D kinematics with constant acceleration, I gave the example of throwing an object up and down and falling, but there we just did falling straight up and down. Okay, so if I throw something up, you know, it would go up and then come down along the same line, or I could just, you know, be at the top of a building and let go of something and it would fall straight down, and of course it falls along a straight line. But uh, now we want to, uh, um, generalize that. We want to throw something at an angle. And uh, everyone who's tossed a ball knows that when you throw something at an angle, it, it makes this kind of an arc in space. It turns out that that arc is actually a parabola. Okay, and uh, we'll see the equation for that in a second, but uh, there's a parabola. So here what I have is a picture of a 2D plane, and you should be picturing a vertical plane, okay, so, uh, or, or this way, maybe in the plane of the, um, <clears throat> of the screen, all right. And so uh, we have two axes, we have the x-axis, and we'll put the x-axis horizontally, okay. So that's like um, parallel to the ground, okay, horizontally. And the vertical axis will be the y-axis, all right. And, uh, you know, here's a, a ball, say, or whatever object you want to toss. Later on, we'll be firing uh, cannonballs out of cannons. And, you know, you toss this ball into the air. And uh, what does it do? Well, it goes up and it comes down and it actually traces out this parabolic shape, okay. Uh, why is this constant acceleration? Well, because the acceleration due to gravity is constant. But remember, it's a it's two numbers, okay? And if you want to think about it in polar, there's a magnitude. That's like the R from the previous um, lecture. That's just like how much the acceleration is, uh, how big is the acceleration without worrying about the direction. And that turns out to be, as we know, 9.8 meters per second squared. The direction is down. Okay, so in this diagram, I've written it here as G, and you'll start, you'll see me now writing from this point on the acceleration due to gravity as G. Okay, it still is A, an acceleration, but to specify that it's an acceleration due to gravity, uh, you know, most textbooks will actually use G, and so I'm going to adopt the same convention. Okay, so, uh, you know, here's G, the acceleration due to gravity, it's 9.8 meters per second squared down. Take a look at it though in the XY plane, it's actually in the negative y direction. Positive y is up, negative y is down, okay? So if you make your, uh, if you place your uh, axes, the x-axis horizontal to the ground and the y-axis vertical, then g is in purely the negative y direction. In fact, there is no x component to, to g. Because why? Well, because it isn't heading towards the left or the right. If there was like a little bit of the vector to the left or a little bit of the vector to the right, like that way or maybe that way, then there would be an x component. No, but because it's straight down, it's purely along the in the negative y direction. There is no x component, okay? Now, the reason I'm making a big deal about that is because that's going to simplify our equations quite a bit later. You could, if you, you wanted to, I don't recommend that you do that. You don't have to choose the x-axis horizontal to the ground. You don't have to choose the y-axis vertical. You could choose it in any orientation you want. But if you do that, the equations I'm going to give you aren't going to work. You'd have to use much more complicated equations. Why? Well, because g is still down, but then you would have an x component to g and a y component to g, and that would make life a lot more difficult. So, uh, in order to use the equations that I'm going to give you in just a second, we really always want to stick to the convention of when we're doing projectile motion, the motion uh, under the um, constant uh, acceleration due to gravity is called projectile motion. Okay, whenever you want to do projectile motion uh, problems, I recommend that you choose the x-axis 
horizontal to the ground and the, the y-axis vertical. Okay, so um, all right, there, that sets up the problem. Now um, let's look at the kinematic quantities before I jump in and give you the formulas because they're going to look a little bit more complicated. Why? Well, because you remember like in 1D we had an initial position and an initial velocity. Let's look at the initial position. The initial position has to be a vector because position is a vector. Even final position has to be uh, a vector. All position has to be a vector. So in the equations, you'll have an initial position and a final position, and that has to be a vector. Okay. So here's x naught, and you'll see that I have that little vector hat on it. Okay. It looks like the average, the straight line, but it isn't. It's got just like a little bit of an arrow there like that. So this is usually what indicates it's a vector. And that single mathematical symbol is actually two numbers. Okay, so um, we won't often use write that symbol. We'll actually break it up into the two pieces, and one piece of it we'll call x naught, and that is the x projection of the initial position, and y naught that'll be the y projection of the initial position. So both that x naught and y naught, those two numbers, that pair of numbers, that's what's in the initial position. So if I say what's the initial position on a test or in a quiz, something like that, uh, don't answer with just one number because that would be incorrect. You can't say the initial position is three meters because that doesn't make sense. You'd have to give an x component and a y component. By the way, I should say something about the language. Uh, sometimes you'll hear me calling it x projection and sometimes you'll hear me calling it x component and same thing with y projection, y component. Projection component, totally synonymous, okay? So um, just to be very clear, there's not, there's no distinction between the two, okay? So the initial position has both an x and y component, and we will call the x component of the initial position x naught, and the y component of the initial position y naught, okay? But it's not just position that has uh, two components to it, velocity does as well. So the initial velocity is also a vector, and it's going to have an x component and a y component, and now the notation gets a little bit more complicated, but not that bad. We're going to call the x component of the initial velocity v naught x, okay? Or, or x projection, whichever you like, okay? So v naught x. And the y projection, we will call v naught y. So v naught x and v naught y, those are the two numbers that paired together are the Cartesian co coordinates for the initial um, velocity, okay? Now, what about the final uh, position and final velocity? Or that is the the position after a time t and the velocity after a time t. Well, they're going to have the symbol x and v, just like they did in 1D. But in 2D, they're a vector, so you see the little vector hat there. And uh, the velocity is also a vector, so you can see the little vector hat there. And again, in 2D, whenever you see a vector, it's just two numbers. Okay, and we'll call the, the x and y components of the final position x and y like that okay don't confuse x with the vector hat on it with just x without a vector hat x without a vector hat that's the x component x with the vector hat is the pair of numbers meaning the position okay hopefully that notation won't be too confusing but i think once i gave you the equations it'll be pretty clear same thing with the velocity uh, the final velocity will have an x component we'll call that vx and vy okay so v not x how should you read that x component of the initial velocity. So the x means x component, the little not there, the little o subscript, that means initial and velocity, okay? And if you see xv like that, uh, sorry, vx like that, uh, the x just means the x component of the final velocity because there's no little not there, it'll be the final velocity, okay? Uh, well, there's the position, there's the velocity. What about the acceleration? Well, I just argued a minute ago that the acceleration, it's also a vector, has two components, ax and ay, okay? But the x component is zero. Why? Because the uh, acceleration is purely in the vertical direction, purely in the y direction, okay? So there is no x component to the acceleration, ax is zero. It won't even appear in the equations because why put it into the equations? You're just gonna substitute zero into it anyhow and that term will drop out. But the y component, that's gonna equal negative because it's down and we chose up to be positive. Acceleration is down. So negative 9.8 meters per second squared, okay? Uh, and again, because this is the theory part of the course, uh, in the lab, you really want to use 9.8, okay? But in the theory part, you know, to make our math a little bit easier, uh, uh, I'll just round that off to negative 10 meters per second squared. It's a 2% error, but it just makes the, uh, the math so much easier, and then you don't have to carry all these decimals, okay? All right, so um, there's an explanation of initial 
uh, position, um, velocity, and acceleration, and also final position and velocity. Uh, what, do, what do the equations look like? <clears throat> well, they look like this, okay? So I'm just going to present them to you without uh, proving them, but um, they're actually very similar to the 1D. All right. Uh, the notation is different, be different because you have an x component and a y component, but um, the, um, um, the, 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 the form of the equations are similar. Okay. So let's take a look at equation number one. It's uh, y is equal to one half a y t squared plus v naught y t plus y naught. Okay. That looks an awful lot like our x is equal to one half a t squared plus v naught t plus x naught. All right. Which was the 1D equivalent of this equation. But this one is in Y, that is it's vertical, okay? And you'll notice it's Y is equal to 1 half AY, all right? That's the acceleration in the Y direction, T squared, plus V naught Y. So what's that? That is the initial velocity, but the Y component only times T, plus Y naught. And what's Y naught? It's the Y component of the initial position, okay? So there's one equation, all right? And very similar to the one, it's 1D equivalent. Here's equation number two, also very similar to equation number two for 1D, uh, but again, it's got the subscripts because now we have to worry about X and Y component. So it reads VY is equal to AYT plus V naught Y, okay? And what does it say? The velocity, the Y component of the velocity after some time T is equal to the Y component of the acceleration times T plus <clears throat> the initial velocity Y component. Okay, so the final, uh, the, the y component of the final velocity is equal to the acceleration in the y direction times t plus the initial component, uh, the, the y component of the initial velocity. All right, now if you take equations number one and equations number two and you eliminate time between them, you get this equation three, and guess what? It's just like equation three. Uh, and 1D, okay, but again, it's um, it, it's got those subscripts because we're talking only the y direction here, and so it's vy squared is equal to v naught y squared plus 2ay y minus y naught, okay, so there it is. Again, this equation number three is not a new equation. It's really just equations one and two with the time eliminated. It's just very convenient to memorize that equation to make use of it directly in formulas rather than trying to uh, use one and the other. Otherwise, you, you tend to have a lot of steps and you tend to get lost. So it is it is good to memorize even though equation three is not independent of one and two, okay? And then finally, there's equation number four. If you take a look at equations one, two, and three, they have no information about x at all. It's only equation number four that has x information. And it's basically x is equal to v naught xt plus v naught, okay? And you look at that and you go, oh, that's interesting. This is the x component of the position after some time t. And this is the y component of the position after some time t. These two equations, equations one and four, they look similar, okay? Except equation one has a quadratic in it and equation four doesn't, doesn't okay? Why is there a, quad, a, a quadratic, like a square here? in uh, equation one? Well, that's because there's an AY, all right? There is no AX. You could think that maybe there's like a one half AXT squared in here, but what's AX equal to? Zero, and it drops out, okay? So actually equation four is kind of like the quadratic equivalent of equation one for X, but since AX is zero, it just reduces to this linear here like that, okay? And that's it. Those are the, the four equations, all right? So, um, uh, if it's a little bit foggy, uh, don't worry. I'm going to show you in the context of problems how you make use of these equations, and then I think it'll become a lot clearer. Usually students that come to this, the, the first thing they get overwhelmed with are all the little subscripts, okay? And so, you know, just uh, look back at how I described each one of them. So, you know, if you pick, pick one symbol, like, I don't know, pick the V naught Y, and go, what is that again, okay? So V means velocity. The little naught there means initial and the Y means Y projection only or Y component only, okay? And over here, you have VY. You go, what does VY mean? Well, V means velocity. There's no not, so that means final or after some time T, and Y means the Y component of the velocity, okay? And so it's per, it'll, it'll, it'll come after a while. Okay, uh, there's not much more theory. Um, uh, I'm not going to prove these equations. I'm just going to give them to you. Uh, proving them doesn't really add much to your intuition. They're very similar to what I did in 1D, but again in 2D. All right, so you don't really get much by going and, and uh, for me proving 
proving to you how they um, get constructed. Okay, so let's just jump into a um, <clears throat> a problem here. This is a fairly simple problem. I have um, a cannon, which I'm going to place at the origin. In fact, you can see here. Uh, let me scroll down just a little bit more. You can read the English. A cannon at the origin. So this this diagram right here. That's a a poor diagram of a cannon, but it's, there it is. Okay, so there's a cannon at the origin. It fires a shot at 50 meters per second at 30 degrees above the horizon on a level field. Okay, so what am I saying there? Here's my level field down here. Okay, that's the uh, uh, x-axis. All right, there's my level field. And I'm going to fire a cannon. So there's a shot coming out of the cannon. There, like that. Okay, you can see the shot right there. And it's traveling at 50 meters per second. All right, and it's 30 degrees above the horizon. What that means is that you start with your cannon, like pointing towards the horizon, and then you incline it 10 degrees, 20 degrees, 30 degrees, and you shoot it. And you can see here I drew into the diagram, you know, the 30 degrees. Okay, so that's what we mean by the words 30 degrees above the horizon. Okay, it means that, you know, the inclination of the initial velocity is 30 degrees. Okay, and I asked the question, how far does the shot travel? Um, um, how far does the shot land from the origin? So here's the origin. And here's where the shot lands right there. Okay. And I want to know how far does it travel? You can see that little question mark there. All right. And uh, I didn't say this, but it's kind of implicit. This is on the surface of the earth. And so there's the, an acceleration due to gravity. It's negative 10 meters per second squared down. Okay. All right. So how do you do this? Well, the first thing you do is draw the diagram. Okay. Um, it is possible that I could give you just the words without the diagram because the words are clear enough that you would be able to draw the diagram and so if I didn't give you the diagram what would you do well the first thing you would do is draw the diagram without the x and y okay so you know just draw a cannon here and then draw the, the this like a dashed line showing the uh, parabolic trajectory of the projectile motion okay and then the next thing you should do is draw the x and y um, axis. The x-axis keep it horizontal, the y-axis keep it uh, vertical for the reasons we mentioned. And uh, notice that I said uh, the cannon is at the origin. So the origin has to be here. That's where the x and y-axis cross. So you're going to draw the x-axis through the cannon and you're going to draw the y-axis through the cannon there like that. And there it is at the origin. Okay. And uh, then the next thing you're going to do is um, um, basically try to identify the initial position the final position, the initial velocity, the final velocity, and the acceleration. Just try to write down those numbers. This is exactly what we did in 1D, but now we have to do it in 2D. And again, when I say identify the initial position, you're going to need two numbers. Okay, so try to do it in that order, initial position, initial um, uh, velocity, final position, final velocity, and uh, and time if you have that. I don't, don't give you time here. And then, then start to plug into the uh, equations, okay? And you say, how do you get the uh, um, x and y components of these things? Well, you get them by reading them off of the uh, x, y graph, all right? So let's start. So for the initial position, where does this thing start? Well, it starts at the origin. OK, and so the initial position of the shot uh, is um, its X component is zero and its Y component is zero. OK, why? Well, I didn't draw in the zero zero here, but that's the origin. And what do you mean by the origin? We, what you mean by the origin is where X is equal to zero. OK, so, you know, X is negative this way to the to the left. X is positive that way. So X is zero right there. And Y is zero as well, because uh, Y is uh, positive up. Uh, y is negative down, and uh, the cannon is right at the uh, the middle between up and down. Okay, it's on ground level, and so that's also at the origin. All right, and so what you could do is you could write x naught, which is the x component of the initial position, write that as equal to zero meters, and y naught, which is the y component of the initial position, that's also zero. Okay, so great, we've got the initial position. Okay, now you can do the final position. All right, and you take a look at the, the graph here, oh, sorry, the diagram, and uh, there it is initially, and then it follows this, follows the trajectory and hits the ground right there, okay? And you say, what is the X and Y component of this position right there, okay? Now, the X component you don't know. In fact, that's what you're trying to solve for, because you don't know how far it traveled along the X axis before it hit the ground. The Y component you do know, because guess what? It's at ground level again, and ground level in this diagram is y is equal to zero. Okay, so over here, the way you write that is you say, well, the x component that's unknown, so we'll just leave that as a question mark. 
the y component of the final position is zero. All right. So you could see that as I ask the question, what is the initial position? What is the final position? I'm really always asking for two numbers. These two numbers are the initial position. These two numbers are the final position. And sometimes you may not know one of the numbers because that's what you're solving for. And so there'll be a question mark like that. Okay. Next, let's do the initial velocity. It must also be two numbers. So let's go back up and take a look at the diagram. I tell you that the initial velocity is 50 meters per second at 30 degrees above the horizon. 30 degrees above the horizon is 30 degrees counterclockwise from the x-axis. So over here there's the x-axis and there's 30 degrees measured counterclockwise okay, uh, from the x-axis. So what kind of uh, coordinate system that I use in describing your initial velocity? Polar because I give you a magnitude and I give you an angle. All right so remember polar is like magnitude and angle and Cartesian is x and y. I didn't give you an x component and a y component of the velocity. I gave you uh, the <clears throat> um, magnitude, 50 meters per second. Magnitude just means how fast, I don't care about the direction, just how fast is it going, and the direction, 30 degrees. Okay, But if you take a look at the equations here, every, every place in the equations, you've either got the y component or the x component. Okay, So the equations are written in Cartesian, but the word problem gives you polar information. So what do you have to do? convert. You have to convert from the polar to the Cartesian. Okay. And so here we go. Um, I've, whoops. Sorry guys, I clicked on the wrong spot. Uh, so here we go. These two numbers, V naught X and V naught Y, they're the X and Y components of the initial velocity. How do you get those? Well, how do you convert from polar to Cartesian? From polar to Cartesian, you use that r sine theta, r cosine theta, and r sine theta. For the x component, you use r cosine theta, and for the y component, you use r sine theta. Okay, and so that r there. Last class, I didn't really say whether we were talking position, velocity, or whatever. Mostly, we were talking position, but the r, the magnitude, it could be whatever. I mean, it could be a position or a distance. Okay, if you're talking like a position vector, but it could also be the speed, the velocity. Okay, and in our case, we're talking about a velocity here. So the r, the magnitude is 50 meters per second. Okay, so r is 50 meters per second, cosine, and what's the angle? It's 30 degrees. Okay, <clears throat> now I was very easy in this problem, and I gave you an angle that you could immediately just plug into the equation. Okay, but be careful, I could give you information about an angle. But it may not be the angle measured from the positive x-axis. Make sure you figure out the angle measured from the positive x-axis. And here it's 30 degrees. Okay, So the uh, x component of the initial velocity is going to be 50 cosine 30. And that's got to equal 43. That's going to equal 43.3 meters per second. Okay, You could just do that on your calculator. All right. Similarly, the y component of the initial velocity is r sine theta. Okay, that's 50 sine of 30 degrees. Sine of 30 degrees is one of those angles you should memorize. It's uh, a half. Okay, so sine of 30 degrees is a half times 50 is 25 meters per second. Okay, so there you go. There is the x and the y components of the initial velocity. The, the initial velocity magnitude is 50 meters per second, but it breaks up into an x component of 43.3 and a y component of 25. All right. All right. Now, what about the um, uh, initial, the x and y component of the final velocity? Okay, that was the uh, x and y components of the initial velocity. Now we want the x and y components of the final velocity. OK, now uh, one thing I didn't mention uh, in the equations and you could actually write a fifth equation, but it's so trivial that I don't usually do that. And, uh, and that is that Vx, the x component of the final velocity is the exact same as the x component of the initial velocity. OK, and you might go, well, why is that? Why doesn't the uh, uh, x component of the velocity change at all? And the answer is because there's no acceleration along the x direction. OK, so remember what it means when you don't have any acceleration at all. It means you're not changing your velocity. So now if we're just looking at the x component, you're not the x component is neither speeding up nor slowing down. The x component starts at 43.3 meters per second and it doesn't speed up or slow down because there's no ax and so it continues at 43.3 meters per second. Okay, So the, the x component of the final velocity is equal to the x component of the initial velocity, which is 43.3 meters per second. Let me try to give you a little bit of a physical intuition into why that's the case. Okay, So let's take a look at this diagram here. 
in the y direction, you could say the shock goes up and it comes down. Why? Because y is like measuring height. It is height. Okay. And so, you know, the, the shot starts at uh, the cannon shot starts at ground level. It goes up and it comes back down. Okay. But the x component of the shot would be like uh, you can imagine a shadow. Suppose the sun is directly overhead. You can imagine a shadow. And I've actually got a, a picture here of the shot, like halfway through the trajectory, part of the way through the trajectory. If you were to find the x projection of that, okay, that's like where its shadow is. It's directly below it on the x axis, okay. And so starting from the ball, there is a shot there, okay. If you just go straight down, you would see its shadow directly below it, okay. That's the x projection or x component, okay. Uh, that's why sometimes it's good to think about it as an x projection because the way I think about it is it's like a shadow. Imagine the sun being directly overhead. Here's the shot up here uh, on the trajectory, but its shadow would be directly below it on the x axis, okay. So it's projected down to the x axis, all right. Now, if you follow the, the x projection down to the bottom you would see you know there's an x when the ball is here the shot is here the x projection will be below it when the shot is here the x projection will be below it when the shot is there the x x projection is there and so on as the ball travels like that or the sorry I keep saying ball it's shot travels the shadow below it travels underneath it at a constant velocity now the velocity of the shot doesn't change it increases and decreases but the velocity of the shadow remains the same. So the shadow of the x component here, that's the x component, x projection, uh, that shadow travels at 43.3 meters per second and it travels at that speed all the way uh, throughout the entire motion. Okay, and so that's kind of a physical interpretation as to why the, um, uh, the uh, uh, x component of the final velocity is equal to the x component of the initial velocity okay and that's 43.3 meters per second we don't know what the y component is of the final velocity well actually we can intuit it because it's symmetrical it will turn out to be negative 25 meters per second but you know before we start to, you know adding any intuition or looking at any equations we don't know right now okay uh, and at this point i have to clear up a confusion you might think something like this you might say oh well the cannonball hits the ground okay and when it does it stops so when the shot is on the ground it stops and so it has zero velocity unfortunately that would be incorrect for vx or vy and the reason is that the equations that we're using know nothing about the ground they just assume an infinite parabola both to the left and to the right of this so they're thinking about the shot like you know the, the equations they, they just look at the shot as traveling right through the ground okay and not stopping now physically that's not what happens because of course it hits the ground and then it stops but as far as the equations are concerned they don't know where the ground is there's no information about the ground they just think you're on some infinite parabola and so the way you should think about this vx and vy is not what is the velocity the x and y component of the velocity when it hits the ground what is the x and y component of the velocity just before it hits the ground okay so the ground hasn't interacted with the shot yet and it is you know still traveling along that parabola with the its velocity and so on and so that's the way to think about this so yeah physically after it's hit the ground it's got zero velocity both vx and vy are zero but just before it hits the ground, uh, Vx and Vy are not zero. And in fact, Vx you know is 43.3, but Vy you don't know. Okay? And uh, there it is. So so um, let me just uh, summarize what we did. We, looked, uh, we identified the, the initial position, x and y component. We identified the final position, x and y component. We identified the initial velocity, x and y, and the final velocity, x and y. For some of these quantities, we don't know the numbers, and so we just put question marks there. For the ones that you do, you can put in the numbers, okay? And then, of course, there's one other thing that goes into the equation, and that is your acceleration, but that's fixed, okay? There is no ax, and in fact, if you look at the equations, there's no x in there, so because ax is zero, they, it dropped out. And ay, we're just going to use negative 10 meters per second squared, okay? Uh, and I keep forgetting about time but you know there's time in the background and time is not a vector time is just a scalar it's just a number okay because it's just whatever you meet, read off of your stopwatch all right now um what are we solving for well go back to the word problem oftentimes like i'm going very slowly 
But oftentimes when you do this, you might have to go back to the word problem, reread it, and say, you know, I've got this information. Where am I heading with this information? And I want to know how far does the shot travel land? Uh, how far does the shot land uh, from the origin? Okay, because of course it goes up and it comes back down, and I want to know that distance from there to there. Now you have to think of, think to yourself, what is that in terms of the quantities that I've just written down? What is that? Well, it's the x component of the final position, isn't it? Because it's like how far it traveled in the x direction. And so that's this quantity right here. Okay. So we're actually trying to solve for x right there. All right. And now you've got all these numbers, but you know that you're solving for x. So let's take a look at the equations. And you take a look at the equations. You say I'm solving for x. And there's only one place that x shows up. Okay. Because the first three equations are all about y. There's no x components in, in equations one, two, and three. Only in, in equation four is there any x information. Okay. And it's x is equal to v naught xt plus x naught. So equation four is what you want to use. Okay. Well, let's start there. Let's see what we can plug in. And so, um, you know, I say solve for x using equation four. I rewrote equation four. I substitute in the numbers. X naught is zero. So it fell out. And V naught X is 43.3. We got that from above. And so we just get this equation. X is equal to 43.3 times T. And I'm going to just call that equation star. But we're not done because I don't know the time. Okay. If I knew the time of flight, that is how long it takes as it goes up and comes back down, then I could substitute in for T. But I don't know it. Okay. I don't know T. And so we're going to have to get T from somewhere else. Okay. So we need T to substitute into the, my equation star here. And you go, well, which equation should I use? And it's a little bit tricky, but usually when it's t time, usually you're, you're going to look at equation number one. Let's look at the equations again and see why we have to use equation number one. This isn't as bad as you think. I mean, it looks like there's a lot of possibility possibilities, but but by the process of elimination, they disappear um, pretty quickly. You can eliminate them pretty quickly. Okay, so um, equation number three here has no time information in it at all. Okay, so since there's no time information at all, you can't use that one. Equation number two, you say, well, maybe I can use that one, but there's two unknowns. There's T, which you don't know, and there's also that VY, which you don't know. So equation number two, you can't use, and that reduces it to equation number one. You have to use equation number one to solve for T. And you know what's coming up next, because equation number one is a quadratic. Not only are you going to use equation number one, but to solve for T, you're going to have to make use of the quadratic formula the same way we did in uh, 1D uh, kinematics. Okay, so let's go back to where we left off here. Uh, we need... Oh, I did it again, guys, sorry. Uh, we need time to substitute into that equation asterisk. We're going to use equation number one for the reasons I just said. So here's equation number one rewritten. Y is equal to one half a y t squared plus b naught y t plus y naught. Okay. And substitute in. Uh, where do you get them? Well, that's that chart we made up above, you know, where we had the initial position x and y, final position x and y, and so on. Well, the final y, okay, that is the height of the thing, uh, the height of the shot when it hits the ground was zero because it got back to ground level. So y is equal to zero. So I just substitute in zero for y. Uh, a y, that's your acceleration in the y direction. That's negative 10. We don't know the time. So we have to leave that as t squared there. V naught y, if you take a look above, v naught y was 25. So we have 25 times t. And y naught was the initial height of the shot. And that was at ground level. And so that's zero too. And so we got that equation right there, which simplifies to zero is equal to negative 5t squared plus 25t. Okay. And the next thing I did is I just divided through by negative 5 to, you know, clean it up a bit. So zero divided by negative 5 is zero. Negative 5 divided by negative 5 is uh, 1. So you just get the t squared there. And then 25 divided by negative 5 is negative 5. So this equation here reduces to 0 is equal to t squared minus 5t. Okay. It factorizes very trivially, so I'm not actually going to use the quadratic equation here. You can, and it'll give you the answer, but it's just so trivial that I'm not going to do that. Don't worry, there'll be opportunity to use the uh, quadratic equation later. But uh, here, I can just factor out a t. So I get t times t minus 5 is equal to 0. And there are two solutions. And what are those two solutions? t equals 0, because if I put 0 there, I don't care what this factor is. 0 times anything is 0. And the other one is 5, because if I put 
t minus uh, 5. If I put in 5 for t, 5 minus 5 is 0. And then again, I get 0. So there are two solutions, and they're t equals 0 and t equals 5. Why two solutions? Because what you're really asking in using equation 1 is, at what times is this shot at, this cannon shot at a height of 0? Well, it's there twice, isn't it? When is it at ground level? Another way to say it. Well, it's at ground level at t equals 0, and then tick, 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 tick. It's at ground level five at 5 seconds. Okay, so it's at ground level twice, 0 and 5 seconds. Well, which one do we want? Well, obviously, we want after the 5 seconds, okay, because we want the final uh, position. And so we're going to take the 5 seconds here and substitute that into that equation star and so x is equal to 43.3 times 5 and that tells you that uh, multiply that out on your calculator that tells you that it travels 216.5 meters horizontally before it hits the ground okay so there you go there's the the problem all right uh, let me just say one thing about this problem before we go on to a more complicated problem this problem is actually symmetrical which is why you really don't need the quadratic here why it factorizes very nicely and um, why what do i mean by it's symmetrical we'll take a look here you start at ground level and you end up at ground level and so uh you know even though my diagram is uh, not that good you know i've got a kind of a segment of the parabola but it's symmetrical about its middle okay and so whenever you have symmetrical parabolas just like you saw in the examples in 1d whenever you're the two legs of the of the parabola around the vertex here about around the maximum height whenever they're they're uh, symmetrical so like this is just a mirror image of that your quadratic is going to factorize very easily okay uh, so um, let's do another problem now and I'm going to um, not make it symmetrical okay so here I already drew uh, most of the diagram for you uh, but I could have just given you the uh, the word problem down here and expected you to, to draw it uh, because it's not that hard. So we place a cannon at the top of a hill 30 meters high and fire a shot at 100 meters per second at 45 degrees above the horizon. Okay, so similar to the previous one, but now we're not at ground level with our cannon. We're at uh, a height of 100 meters. Okay, and I'm um, oh, sorry, 30 meters, and we're firing at, at 100 meters per second and at 45 degrees. Okay, so uh, suppose I just gave you just the words. What would you do? Okay, and I know I haven't asked the question yet. That's part A and part B. But you know, I just tell you, look, there's a cannon at the top of a hill 30 meters high, and we fire a shot 100 meters per second at 45 degrees above the horizon. What should you draw? So the first thing I would draw is, don't worry about the coordinate system, first thing I would draw is just a hill. So here you go, there's like a, a hill, it looks more like a cliff here, okay? And uh, here's the cannon up here at the top of the hill. So I would just draw the, the, the hill there like that, and I put the cannon up there like that. And then the next thing I would draw is the, the shot being fired, like that. And I would draw it at 45 degrees to the uh, horizon. Now, we're at the top of the hill here. The horizon would be straight out like that. So you see I have a plus x axis down here. But I'm also going to draw a horizon up there. Okay, Remember when we were doing vectors and we said, look, the vector might not be at the origin. And if the vector is not at the origin, how do you decide how to draw the angle? Well, at the tail of the vector, just attach a little... Uh, 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 um, x axis and here you can see my little dashed x axis which it shows the horizon okay and it's 45 degrees above the horizon and so the shot goes out like that at 100 meters per second at 45 degrees and you might as well draw a dashed line showing you know how the the shot will continue through the air until it hits the ground okay great so that's what i would draw first so again the cliff the cannon and then just show the trajectory there the next thing is we're going to add the uh, x and y axis. Now the only thing, the only constraint you have is that the x axis for the equations to work. The only constraint you have is that the x axis has to be horizontal, and the y axis has to be vertical. But you have a little bit of choice about where you're going to put the origin, and so you could put the origin down here, which is what I did in this problem, that is at the base of the cliff, underneath or the base of the hill, underneath the cannon. Okay, so you could put the origin down there, but equivalently, you could put the origin up here. Now, depending on where you choose it, you're actually going to get different numbers when you crunch through the math. But it doesn't matter because when you go to draw in the diagram where the answer is, it'll still come out to be the same place. Let me show you why. If you put the origin here, then when you get to the bottom, when the shot gets to the bottom and hits the ground, its height is zero. But if you put the origin here, then y equals 0 is here. Anything below that is negative y. 
So if you solve it with the origin here, you're going to get one value of y, y equals zero. But if you solve it with the origin here, then you're actually going to get a negative value of y. The numbers are different, but when you go to draw it on the diagram, you're still going to find the same place. Okay, so just keep that in mind. You do have this choice, and here you have a choice of where to place the origin, and um, it would work out just as fine. And it's not that much more difficult to put the origin at the bottom or at the cannon there like that. But uh, to avoid some negative numbers, I'm going to put the origin directly below the cannon at ground level. So right there we go. There's the origin. Okay. And uh, the distance from the origin to the top of the hill here, that's going to be 30 meters there like that. And what I'm going to ask for in question A is how far does the shot travel before hitting the ground? I should have probably said horizontally to be very clear. And so really what I want is this question mark there. It's like from the origin to where it hits the ground, how far does it travel horizontally? Okay. So uh, there's one question that we're going to ask, and then the other question we're going to ask is, um, what is the maximum height, okay, achieved by the shot? All right, so um, there we go. There's the entire problem. Uh, usually on a test for something that's this simple, I would simple. I would just give you the you know the word problem like that, okay, and expect you to to draw the diagram. I would on a test because um, you know you have to. They're multiple choice. You're going to have to match the answer you get to my answer. You know, I'm going to tell you where to put the origin so that we get the same numbers. Because again, you have a choice where the origin is, and you could do the problem totally correctly, but get different numbers out. Okay, uh, simply because everything is being measured with respect to the origin, and you've got a different origin. So on a test, I would probably give you this word problem here, and also tell you where the uh, uh, the origin is. Okay. All right, great. So uh, you know, uh, draw the diagram, then superimpose on the diagram the x and y uh, axes, and then identify the initial position, final position, initial velocity, final velocity, acceleration, and time. Okay, and uh, initial position, two numbers, final position, two numbers, initial velocity, two numbers, final velocity, two numbers. Okay, so let's go through those. I say, where does it start? Well, there's the initial position. That's your x naught, y naught pair of numbers. And you say, where does it start? 0, 30. Why 0, 30? Well, because the, the cannon shot starts at the cannon. OK, so there it is. And where is the cannon? Well, its x component is zero because it's directly above the origin there. OK, along the x axis. But the y component is 30 meters because it's 30 meters high. OK, it's 30 meters above the origin. So in this case, the uh, shot starts at zero, 30 meters. OK, uh, what about the final? position. OK, so now we want x and y for the final position. And that's going to be down here. Well, the x component, we don't know because we don't know how far it traveled along x. We don't know how far it traveled horizontally. The y component is, well, it's at ground level. And ground level, the origin is here at ground level. So y is equal to 0. OK, so <clears throat> for the final position, we have x is equal to question mark. We don't know what that is. But y is equal to 0 meters. OK, what about the initial velocity? That's up here, right? OK, so there is the initial velocity and uh, it's in polar coordinates. OK, the magnitude that is how fast is it going irrespective of direction is 100 meters per second. OK, so that's like your R when you're going to convert from uh, R theta to uh, X, Y. So um, 100 meters per second and the angle. Remember how you measure that because the, the tail of the vector isn't at the origin. So just like put a little X axis there, attach a little X axis at the uh, uh, the tail of the vector. Uh, we're just worried about the direction there. OK, so there's my little dashed, my little temporary x axis there. And then I measure and it's 45 degrees like that. OK, and so the um, x component of the initial velocity is r cosine theta. That's 100 cosine 45 degrees, which turns out to be 70.7 meters per second. OK, and then there's the y component of the initial velocity. Again, that's r sine theta. So it's 100 sine of 45 degrees, and that's 70.7 meters per second. OK, there you go. There's the x and y components of your initial velocity. OK, what about the x and y components of the final velocity? Well, remember, the x component doesn't change because it travels a constant uh, 
velocity in the x direction. Okay, so if v naught x is 70.7, then vx is 70.7 meters per second. Okay, but the vy we don't know. Again, don't make the mistake and say, well, it hit the ground, so it must be zero. No, we're thinking about just before it hit the ground because the again the equations uh, don't know about the decelerating effect of the ground. Okay, all they know about is the accelerating effect of gravity. They don't know about the ground. So the conceptually the way to think about vy is what's the um, y component of the velocity just before it hits the ground. Okay, uh, the acceleration in the x direction there is none, so I didn't even write it down. The acceleration in the y direction is negative 10 meters per second squared, and the time I didn't give you any time information. Okay, so actually in using the equations, you actually follow very similarly the the um, steps that I gave in the previous problem, but now because the we don't have a, a, a symmetrical uh, segment of the um, parabola, it's not going to be so easy to solve it mathematically. Okay, so for the first part, part A here, I say how far does the shot travel horizontally before hitting the ground? And that's x, right? And we don't know x. And just like above, we're going to use equation number four to get x. Okay, so equation number four reads x is equal to v naught xt plus x naught. And substitute in, well, we know that v naught x is 70.7 x naught is zero, and so that equation just reduces to x is equal to 70.7 times t. We don't know time, so we can't solve for x yet. So what do we need to do? We need to solve for time. And here, I don't know why I called it equation a instead of equation star, but it's the you know the equivalent of equation star for this problem. Okay. So now for t to get the time, use equation one. So there we go. There's our equation uh, one. Y is equal to one half a y t squared plus v naught y t plus y naught, and we substitute in the numbers. The y component of the final position, well, it's at ground level, okay, when it hits the ground, so that's zero, okay. A y, that's the acceleration in the y direction. It's a negative ten meters per second squared, okay. So there's the negative ten. The uh, y component of the initial velocity, that's seventy point seven. So there's that for v naught y. We'll put in that, and the initial height we y naught is the initial height that's 30 this time and so there it is uh, simplifying that a little bit you know like a half times negative 10 is negative 5 okay this gives you uh, this equation here all right and uh, what I like to do in these equations is whatever the number is whatever the coefficient is in front of t squared just divide through by that and it always turns out to be negative 5 why because a y is negative 10 and there's a half there, and a half of negative 10 is negative 5. So you're going to see that I'll always just divide out the negative 5. And so if I have negative 5t squared, divide out the negative 5, that's just t squared. I have 70.7 divided by negative 5, and that gives me negative 14.1. Just do that on your calculator, okay? And here I have 30, so it's positive 30 divided by negative 5. Positive 30 divided by negative 5 is negative 6. And so I have negative six here. Okay, so um, <clears throat> my equation number one reduces to this very simple quadratic: zero is equal to uh, t squared minus fourteen point one t uh, minus six. Okay, and then just identify all the coefficients that go into the quadratic formula. A capital A in the quadratic formula is one here. Capital B include the sign. Okay, is negative fourteen point one. So capital B is negative fourteen point one, and capital C is negative six. Again, include the sign there like that. And the quadratic formula. What does it look like? T is equal to minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus four ac, all divided by two a. My capital A is one. So that disappears. That's that makes uh, life a lot easier. But then I have to substitute in b and c. Watch it. B is negative, but there's a negative in front of it. So essentially, this is like negative, negative 14.1, and a negative, negative is positive, so you get 14.1. Plus or minus, there are two solutions, okay? And, uh, you know, um, B squared is 14.1 squared, minus 4, A was 1. B is negative 6, so make sure you carry that sign in there, so you got negative 4 times negative 6, okay? And then I'll divide it by 2. All right, so uh, just working this out on your calculator, you get that it's 14.1 plus or minus 15 divided by 2. Now, how do you do this? Well, you know, the plus and minus are each individual solutions. So for the first solution, you go 14.1 plus 15 divided by 2, and that gives you 14.6 seconds. And for the second solution, you do 14.1 minus 15 divided by 2, and that gives you negative 0.45. 
uh, seconds. Okay. Now, if you take a look at this, you go, well, which solution do I want? It's pretty obvious that you want the positive solution. Not that the negative solution doesn't have a physical meaning to it, but you want the positive solution. So let's go back to the diagram and take a look at why we want the positive solution. So over here, we're <clears throat> at the origin. That's a t equals zero. Tick, 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 tick. You get to the top and then you come down and at positive 14.6 seconds, you're at ground level. What if you ran the clock backwards into negative time? You say, well, what does that mean? That means time previous to when you were at the origin. Well, again, those equations, they, they, they assume like an infinite parabola. So just extend this leg of the parabola all the way out to infinity there and then extend this one to infinity. Positive, here you are at t equals zero. Positive time goes this way. Negative time goes this way, so that negative 0.45 seconds is when you would have been at ground level at negative time. Okay, so 0.45 seconds before you got to the origin, the parabola would have placed the shot at ground level. Okay, now um, I shouldn't say that it has a physical interpretation, it has an interpretation, but physically it wasn't there because the whole motion began at t equals zero. Okay, but if you want to give an interpretation to that negative. Um, uh, time, that's what it would mean. Okay. Now, uh, again, here you don't need it, but I'm going to show you, I'm going to leave you with a, um, I'm not actually going to show, uh, solve it. I'm going to give you uh, uh, a kind of a, um, a half problem at the end, which I want you to think about. Um, we'll do a problem like it in, during the tutorial sessions, but uh, you know, uh, where you'll get two positive times and then you're going to have to choose which of the two positive times you need. Okay. So don't assume that it's always just choose the positive. That's not going to work all the time. Sometimes you'll get two positive uh, times here and you're going to have to think the way I, you know, reason the same way I was just reasoning a minute ago to figure out which one you want. Okay. But that's the very last problem when we get there. Okay. Uh, so that solves part A because now if you take 14.6 and substitute it into that equation A, you know, we have the time. So it's 70.7. .7, that was your V naught X multiplied by 14.6. There's your time. And that tells you that it travels, the shot travels 1032 meters. Um, you know, horizontally before it hits the ground or a little bit over a kilometer. Okay. Uh, and that sounds reasonable for, for a cannon. Okay. Part B was I asked, what is the maximum height achieved by the shot? Okay. Now this is a little bit tricky because you see this process where we identified initial final position, initial final velocity, we're going to have to repeat that. And the reason we're going to have to repeat it, not totally repeat it, but we're going to have to rethink it because if you take a look here in part A, I said the motion started here and traveled until it got to there. Okay. So I was interested in this entire segment of the parabola that I've drawn there. But in part B, I'm really only interested until it gets to the maximum height here. So I put a little dot there like that. We're not looking at the final position and final velocity there. We're looking at the final position and final velocity at the top there. Now, I know that might sound unintuitive. You say, well, what do you mean? Isn't it going to continue past that point? I know it will. It'll go up and it'll come down, obviously. But as far as answering part B, the X and V that I want is going to be for that point right there. Okay. So that's, that's why I'm, I'm being very careful here. And we're going to have to rethink these numbers because, and, and watch this on a test because you know, you don't want to use these numbers again. And you don't want to use those numbers again, because they won't work. The initial ones are the same, but the final ones are different because you're worried about a different ending point along the, the parabola. Okay. So uh, let's go down to where I solved part B. And you can see here that I rethought the entire uh, problem. Uh, the initial position, that is x naught and y naught, x naught and y naught pair, is 0 and 30 meters. That didn't change, okay? The, the shot still starts at the cannon, which is at uh, uh, x component 0, y component 30 meters above the origin, okay? Uh, x and y now, that's the final position, that, that's, that's at its maximum height. We don't know. We don't know either one of them, okay? So take a look here back at the picture. Right. Uh, you know, we say, well, what's the X and Y there? We don't know. Okay. And don't guess, uh, you know, um, if you can't, if you can't read it off, like you just look here and say, well, what's the X there? Well, I don't have a marking there. Okay. And what's Y over there? Well, I don't have a marking there. So you can't guess here. You see, it's not guessing because you know that that's 30 along the Y axis and zero along X. And so, you know, you can actually just read off of the X and Y axis what that position is, but you can't read that off there. Okay. And so uh, you don't know the X and Y components of the, sorry, 
I, I keep making this mistake. There we go. Uh, you don't know the X and Y components of uh, uh, the final position. What about the initial velocity? Well, there's no difference. Okay, the initial velocity is the same as in the previous problem, so we can just rewrite those. Okay, no need to recalculate them. But the final velocity, X and Y component, we do know. For the X component, we know that that doesn't change. So if V naught X is 70.7, then VX is 70.7. V not y starts off at 70.7, but then I wrote here that Vy is zero, and you go, well, why? Why is that zero? Well, let's take a look up here. Okay, what does Vy mean? It's the y component of the velocity. So what is the velocity doing? Well, on this portion of the parabola, the shot is moving up. Okay, that I'm drawing, I'm just looking at the, um, the, the uh, y component, okay? So you don't care how far it traveled along x. Just look how high it is. It starts at the cliff and then goes higher, 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 higher until it reaches its maximum height. And then what happens? Well, then it starts to come down and then it goes lower, 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 lower. So the y component of the velocity is how much is it traveling up? What, uh, what rate, at what speed is it traveling up? Well, on this leg, it's traveling up. So the y is positive on this leg. It's traveling down, so Vy is negative. And of course, where it switches from positive to negative, Vy must be zero. And that's what defines the maximum height. Okay, so in these projectile problems, if I ask you for the maximum height, what you need to do is set Vy equal to zero. It's a little bit unintuitive because you're saying what's the maximum height. But the point is, is that at the maximum height, Vy is zero, not Vx because it still has some velocity in the x component. In fact, the velocity in the x component doesn't change at all. It's the y component of the velocity which temporarily becomes zero at that instance when it reaches the maximum height, okay? And so that's why over here, when I'm doing the problem and I'm going through the initial and final uh, velocities, for the final velocity, I know that the vx is the same as the initial, Okay, because there's no acceleration in the x direction. Okay, so um, I'm covering it here, but this says uh, ax is equal to zero. And since ax is equal to zero, uh, you know that uh, v naught x doesn't change. Okay, so it stays 70.7. Vy is positive, but then at the maximum height, it temporarily stops before it starts to come back down. So there it is, zero meters per second. Okay, so uh, here I have written stops going up and starts coming down. Vy is zero. Okay, well, the acceleration is still negative in the y direction is still negative 10 meters per second squared and you don't know the um, the time okay and so you take a look here and you go well what did i ask for what, what do i want you to solve well i want the maximum height height that's the vertical distance that's why so i want you to solve for y okay and i want you to solve for y and you don't know the time okay so i already say here to use equation three but just to show you how you can use this process of elimination to figure out what, what equation you want. Let's scroll all the way back up to where I had those three equations. Whoops, I went past, okay? Here's where I have the three equations and let's go through them. I wanna calculate y. What's y? That's the uh, maximum height, okay? Now you could say, well, why can't you use equation number one? In fact, in equation number one, y is isolated. Yeah, well, you can't because you don't know t, okay? You say, well, can't I find t using some other equation? Yeah, you could. You could you find t using equation two, plug it into equation one and then you get it. But you remember that eliminating time from equation one and two is the same as equation three. So if you don't know the time, try to look at equation number three. Equation number three is the only one that doesn't have time in it, okay? So you take a look at equation number three and you say, I wanna solve for y, is there a y in there? Yes, okay. So let's try to substitute in the numbers and hopefully y will be the only unknown. And if that's the case, we'll be able to solve for y. So here I say, okay, let's uh, solve for y using equation number three. There's equation number three rewritten. Let's plug in all the numbers. Vy, the y component of the final velocity is zero. We're at the maximum height. V naught y is 70.7 meters per second. Okay, and then we got to square that. Two, ay is negative 10. Y is what we're solving for. And the initial height, y naught, is 30. So you can see that when you substitute in all the numbers, the only unknown there is y. And so let's solve for it. So in the next line, I just uh, simplified things. So I took 70.7 uh, squared is uh, 5,000 
minus 2 times negative 10, uh, sorry, plus 2 times negative 10 is minus 20, and y minus y naught, okay? And then I uh, just, you know, move um, one term to the other side and then divide by 20. I get y is equal to, y minus 30 is equal to 250, or y is equal to 280 meters, okay? So there you go. There's your maximum height, all right? And back in the diagram here, does that make sense? Well, the diagram isn't quite to scale. This is only 30 meters, and that doesn't look like, you know, another 250 meters. Admittedly, you know, when you do these problems yourselves, you're not going to know how high things are, what the proportions are. So, you know, that's okay. It doesn't really matter. At least the shape is correct. But basically, if you start at the ground here and you go measure up to the maximum height, you would find that this thing uh, reaches a maximum height of 280 meters okay it starts at 30 meters high it goes an extra 250 meters high to a maximum height of 280 meters okay and that answers uh question b okay all right finally uh let me show you uh oh sorry uh, no not finally uh we got one more problem to do and um, here it is. So now I've got a cannon. And it's at uh, ground level here like that. Okay. And I'm going to fire this cannon. Uh, and uh, the shot's going to go up and it's come going to come down and hit a wall. All right. And this wall here is actually 150 meters from the cannon horizontally measured. Okay. And I think you can picture this in your mind. The shot is going to go up and it's going to come down and it's going to hit the wall. Uh, assuming that it does make the 150 meters, and it will, okay? And I want to know how high along the wall does the, um, the, the, the shot actually hit the wall. You can imagine maybe it getting embedded in the wall, and then you can go there and measure how high it is, okay? So the English reads a cannon at the origin, fires a shot at 50 meters per second at 30 degrees above the horizon, over here, okay? Uh, the shot hits a wall 150 meters away, okay? And uh, how, how high above the ground does the shot uh, hit the wall okay so i want to know that height in there all right so uh you know if i just gave you the english what would you do well draw you know the ground draw the cannon draw the trajectory as it goes up and hits the wall there i guess draw the wall as well and then draw in your x and y axis and decide where you're going to put the origin well it's pretty obvious that we should put the origin where the cannon is okay and uh, then once you've got the x and y axis in there and the origin now you can start to identify the initial final position, initial final velocity, and so on. Okay, so uh, what's the initial uh, position? Well, it's at the origin, so both x and y components are zero. So x not is zero, and y not is zero. Okay, that says I start at the origin, or the, the shot starts at the origin. Okay, so it goes up and it comes down, and it's right there. So there's the final position. Uh, what's its x component? This time we know the x component is. 150 meters. But what's the y component? We don't know. That's what we're solving for. So y is equal to question mark. Okay. Uh, great. So there's the initial position. There's the final position. Okay. What about the velocity? Uh, well, here's the initial velocity, v dot x and v dot y. Once again, you uh, obtain those using our cosine theta and our sine theta. And the theta here, 30 degrees, it's exactly the the, the angle in the diagram. Again, be careful, double check that. Make sure that you're always measuring theta uh, counterclockwise from the positive x axis, and we are in this case. And so if you go 50 cosine theta, it's 43.3, and 50 sine theta is 25. We actually did that in uh, our first problem. And uh, that's the initial x and y components of the velocity. What about the final, the x and y components of the final velocity? Well, the x doesn't change, so that's 43.3, and the y we don't know. Okay, so just put a question mark there. Acceleration due to gravity, negative 10 meters per second squared, then the time we don't know. Okay, so what do we want to solve for? Well, we're solving for y. Okay, and we don't know the time. And so you say to yourself, hmm, how could I do that? Well, you could use equation number three, but I'm going to show you that there's yet another way to do that. Um, personally, if I were doing this, I would go with equation number three. But right now, let's try to do use um, um, equation um, number one. Okay, so using equation number one, we can actually find the time and then substitute that into equation number two. Okay, uh, and let's see what we get here. Um, so we we have um, we want to solve for y using equation one. So there's equation one. Okay, y is equal to one half 
negative t. We don't know why, so just leave it alone. Uh, a is negative 10. Okay, so 1 half negative 10 t squared. V naught y is 25. We just found that. So plus 25 t. And y naught is 0. And that reduces to y is equal to minus uh, 5 t squared plus 25 t. Okay. And we can't go any further, can we? Because we don't know the time. All right. So there's equation A. And then you say, okay, how am I going to get the time? Well, let's use equation uh, four to get the time. And uh, equation four is x is equal to v naught xt plus uh, x naught. And uh, for x, you've got 150. Uh, uh, v naught x is uh, 43.3 times t, and uh, x naught is zero. And then um, uh, just solving for t, that gives you that uh, the time is uh, 3.46 seconds. That's the time of flight before it hits the wall. Once you've got the time, you can substitute that into equation A and out pops 26.5 meters. Okay, and so, and that's the problem here. It goes up and comes down and it hits the wall 26.5 meters above uh, ground level. All right, and that solves the problem. Uh, this one is, um, I wouldn't say it's simple, but you know, once you, it doesn't really do much more uh, it doesn't really require much more than the previous problems, but it's a variation on it because in the previous problems, I kind of told you the final y component. I wanted to find the final x. Where here, I give you the final x. It's 150 meters, and I want you to find the uh, final y. Okay, so just a little variation. All right. Finally, here's a, a problem um, which uh, I'm actually not going to do for you. I just want you to think about this, okay? We'll, we'll look at something like this during the tutorial ses session, okay? So imagine now that you uh, have a cannon, which is at ground level here at the origin, okay? And we're going to fire a shot, and the shot goes up and comes down. But over here, we have like a cliff, okay? And you can even say the cliff is 30 meters high. So the shot goes up and comes down, and it lands on the top of a cliff 30 meters high. OK, now um, in solving this, you're going to want the time. Suppose I even ask you for the time. I want to know how how long is this thing in flight before it hits the top of the cliff? OK, so you would have to use equation number one here to do that. And in using equation number one, uh, you, you would know why, because it's 30 meters. OK, uh, a y, of course, is negative 10. All right. Uh, v not y you don't have, but I would have given it to you just like you did in the previous problems and you get uh, and y not is at ground level. And then you would solve this quadratic and you would get two times. And guess what? You're going to get two positive times. And you go, which one of these two positive times do I want? Why did you even get two positive times? Because before we got a positive time and a negative time. But here you're going to get two positive times. And the reason is that y is equal to 30. This equation is really asking, at what time is it at a height of 30 meters above ground level? And the answer is two times. It's 30 meters above ground level on the way up. Here it is right there. See that dashed line? That's 30 meters. Okay. So as the shot goes up, it passes the 30 meter mark at T1, which is a positive time. And then it goes up past 30 meters, but then it comes back down to 30 meters at time T2. So if you did a problem like this, where it starts at ground level, but then lands at some on top of some cliff, and you solve for the time, you're actually going to get two positive times. And then you say to yourself, well, which one do I want? Well, look at the diagram, think it through. You passed the 30 meter mark on the way up. That's not the one you want. You want the time when it passes the 30 meter mark on the way down. And so you would want that T2 there. Okay. So uh, just be careful about this because uh, don't, don't uh, make up a rule in your head and say, oh, I always want the positive time because in this particular situation, you've got two positive times and you say, which one do you want? You want the longer of the two positive times. Okay. So there we go. Uh, that's our lecture on uh, 2D kinematics. Uh, with uh, the assumption of constant acceleration. And it's also known as uh, projectile motion for obvious reason because this is the motion that projectiles take. Okay, thank you.